This chapter is on infection and disease. First, we want to talk about the host-microbe relationship. Now, under normal circumstances, humans should not have any microbes in utero. The utero, uterus should be sterile. During birth, the newborn is going to be exposed to microbes actually in the birth canal, and those microbes will start to colonize the intestines. And then from milk and the air and just life, they'll get more and more microbes. Humans and microbes develop a symbiotic relationship. Symbiosis is a relationship between two different types of organisms in a given community. We have mutualism. Both members benefit from the interaction. The perfect example in the human is your, your gut bacteria. Uh, it makes you some vitamins. It protects you from invaders of bad bacteria. And what you give to the bacteria is a place to hang out and food to eat. Commensalism, one organism benefits, the other one is neither helped nor harmed. Now an example on this, I've seen videos of schools of fish, little tiny fish, swimming along beside sharks. They stay out of the range of vision of the shark. He doesn't even know they're there. And when he eats, they can grab little tiny bits of food that he spills as he rips his food up. And are you going to go eat that fish that the shark is protecting accidentally? Commensalism. Only, only the little fish are benefiting. Parasitism is one organism benefits while the other is harmed or maybe killed. And a pathogen is a parasite that causes disease. This could be strep throat, this could be COVID, uh, any type of parasitic uh, helminth worm. There's many, many types of parasites. Amensalism, one organism can hamper or prevent the growth or survival of another but it's not affected by that other organism. And penicillium is this way. It sort of pushes other bacteria away, but it doesn't help it as far as directly. It doesn't like eat the other organism. Okay, normal flora. Newborn's first contact to microbes is in the birth canal, then by breathing, then by feeding. And they tend to develop Get new microbes develop a residency in the mucous membranes that are open to the environment, and then they finally populate the gut and the entire intestinal tract. Resident flora remain part of the normal flora throughout the life of that person. Transient flora come and go. They may be in the same locations as the resident flora, but they don't really do anything. They just hang out for a little while and leave. A pathogen is an organism that can cause disease. And many times the normal flora, say in your gut, on your skin, can help prevent pathogens from invading. But if they become unbalanced, say you take antibiotics, then normal flora that's sitting there can become pathogenic. And they may not cause disease in a healthy person. Another th reason you would have opportunistic pathogens, this is compromised immune system, and just changes in the flora. C. diff, Clostridium difficile, is the number one example. You take antibiotics for a long period of time, all the good guy bacteria dies. C. diff stays behind, and then you have screaming diarrhea. Had a student who took this home to her whole family and her husband had a bad case of it on the up escalator at the Macon Mall. If I've already told that story, it's worth telling again. It was tragic. They just had to get on the down escalator and go home. Okay, the entrance of the normal floor into areas of the body where it's not normal. Um, see, this is kind of gross, but Women are especially little girls who don't know better. Wiping their backside from back to front, they may accidentally 
put normal flora E. coli into the urethra and cause a urinary tract infection. Stages infection, contamination, the microbes are there. Then infection, they've gained entry into the tissue, still may not cause disease if you fight it off quickly. Portals of entry, this is where pathogens enter the body. And we say they're exogenous or endogenous. Exogenous, they come from an outside source. Endogenous, they're already there. They're already normal flora, uh, like the C. diff is normal flora in your gut. You're just not supposed to have much of it. Portals of entry uh, are generally going to be the same areas that support normal flora. And most pathogens have their preferred portal of entry, like a bad cold prefers to infect your nose. You're probably not going to get a bad cold on your big toe. So therefore, if it hits the wrong portal, it's just not going to cause a problem. Some can cause infectious agents through more than one portal. Um, so conjunctiva, your eye, your nose, your mouth may all be possible portals of entry for a particular organism. These are showing some examples. Conjunctiva, ears, nose, mouth, insect bites in women, vagina, and placenta. And the placental infection could come vaginally and then go up into the uterus and infect the placenta externally, but more likely it's coming from the bloodstream. Uh, men, penis, urethra, anus, and then broken skin, ingrown toenails, any of these are portal of entries for infection. Specifically skin, it's a thick layer of keratinized dead cells and they have pores, hair follicles and sweat glands so they can get infected and then damaged skin can certainly get infected. The GI tract, this is coming from uh, for pathogens in food, liquid, anything you eat. Enteric bacteria that one tends to get enteric means gut. Uh, salmonella, Shigella, Vibrio, pathogenic E. coli, viruses, polio, hepatitis A. Hepatitis B is bloodborne, but A is actually foodborne and it can come from eating. Uh, raw oysters is one thing I've heard somebody getting it. Um, also heard of them getting a rotavirus from that. Echovirus. Protozoans, Entamoeba histolytica, and Giardia lamblia. So I'm going to back up just a minute. Where did hepatitis A get into an, an oyster or a rotavirus? It's a human pathogen. It had to be through sewage contamination in that uh, place that, you know, in the, the ocean where those things were collected. So it's kind of disgusting, but some people don't treat their sewage properly. Uh, Entamoeba histolytica and Giardia lamblia come from water helmets. Trematodes, cestodes, and nematodes, we'll talk about those. These are your different worms. We'll talk about those more in another chapter. Respiratory tract. This is the most common portal of entry, and it could come through the air from dust particles, moisture, respiratory droplets from infected people. Bacteria could cause anything to sore throats, meningitis, diphtheria, whooping cough, or pertussis. Viruses, uh, common cold, influenza, measles, mumps, chicken pox, rubella, and should one say COVID? I have a friend who's going to a funeral this afternoon for a very dear friend of her husband's because he just died of COVID-19. Didn't think you needed a vaccine. Was overweight, out of shape, smoked, all those things added up. Okay, the urogenital tract. Many are contracted by uh, sexual contact. Um, 
just the full fact that you have the anus close to the urethra can make it possible for women and girls to get infected. Uh, opportunistic infections of the urogenital tract come from E. coli. So if you have an irritation in the uh, urethra or opening and E. coli gets on it, it's going to be more apt to cause the urethra to get infected. It then goes up into the bladder. Now, vaginal yeast infections, opportunistic overgrowth of, now why this is cut off, I don't know, but candida yeast. It's, when you get on antibiotics, you kill off bacteria, then you get a yeast infection. Not always, but it's very common. I know a woman who said every time she goes to the doctor and they write antibiotics, she said, go ahead and write me a pill for the yeast that you're going to give me. Conjunctiva. Often it's a good barrier against infectious agents until you start sticking contact lenses in them. And uh, some bacteria easily attach to the mucous membrane. If your kid goes to school and has pink eye, that's conjunctivitis. It's a possibility it's highly contagious, so they're sending them home until they get a doctor's note. Placenta, generally, most things don't cross the placental barrier, but some do. Um, and they get listeria as an example. Uh, GR, no, let's see, no, toxoplasmosis is another example. Can cause spontaneous abortions, miscarriages, birth defects, premature births, brain defects. Uh, there's many things that can be wrong when you get an infection of that fetus through the placental barrier. Parental route, this is not technically a portal of entry. It's through subcutaneous tissues, nail, thorn, contaminated needles. I remember back in, oh gee, I shouldn't tell you how old I am, but back in the ah, mid to late 70s, I worked for a very short time for a veterinary clinic and they would wash their needles and reuse them, their syringes and needles and reuse them. Nowadays they'd be closed down, but can you imagine that? Uh, but any kind of thing that you get, you know, d dirty, but if you get stuck by a needle that you stuck in a sick person and you accidentally get stuck, then you can get a pathogen introduced. Cuts, accidental cuts, bites, stab wounds, stay out of certain places, I guess. Any kind of deep abrasions and surgery. Such a big deal with surgery. Everything's got to be aseptic, especially bone surgery. I had a knee replacement and they gave me so much IV antibiotics. It was unreal. And then they had a wound vac on it. And just everything had to be just so and bandaged and don't touch it. And anyway, it was not very fun anyway. Okay, virulence and pathogenicity. Virulence is how pathogenic something is, but pathogenicity is disease-provoking power of a specific microbe. When we say it's virulent, I mean when we mean it's hot. It's going to really cause an infection easily. Pathogenicity is related to the number of microbes. If you only get one or two virus particles, you may fight them off. But if you get 500 or 500,000, then you can't. So the number of microbes is big. Portal of entry, they got to go to the right place. That's one reason we wash our hands, because if you touch something, that has germs on it, specifically COVID or other influenza, whatever. You touch something and then you touch your nose, you just put transferred that back, that virus to your nose. So that's why we wash our hands so much. Toast defense. I know people who never seem to get sick, healthy as they could be, others who stay sick. Uh, just the organism itself and virulence factors of that organism. Some are just worse than others. Adhesion. This is the first step to infection. The 
without adhesion, the organism is going to be removed. Now, ways you do it, when you get uh, exposed to an organism, ciliary motion in your nose, sneezing, coughing, swallowing, urine flow, a lot of times you can get contaminated with a bacterium and then go urinate. If it hasn't set up shop yet, it's, it hadn't gotten adhered to your bladder wall, you still don't get an infection. Tears, tears are continuously flowing across your eyes to prevent infection. Intestinal peristalsis, they move. But the bacteria are gonna have to bind to the hosts by some sort of pili, fimbriae, specific receptor sites. And adhesion can be specific or non-specific. Non-specific just attractive forces of nature hydrophobic reactions, electrostatic attractions, molecular vib vibrations, Brownian movement. This is just random movement of microscopic particles and recruitment and trapping by biofilms. This is so important. That's why surgery, putting implants in knees and hips is so important that you don't have bacteria there and also heart valves that may be slightly damaged. They tend to get biofilms growing on them, and that's not a good thing. Specific adhesions, you have an actual receptor that acts as a locking key between a molecule on the cell surface. And this is, once it's attached to that receptor, it's not gonna unattach. Now they gotta colonize the tissues whether it be urinary tract, digestive, respiratory, conjunctiva, but whatever tissues that colonize them, then they invade them. They're going to go into the extracellular substances. They're going to disrupt the host membrane, break down primary and secondary barriers of the host. Now, evasion of host defense, this is what your organisms do to evade, to get away. Some can avoid contact with phagocytes or inhibit the phagocytes from engulfing them. Now, when we talked about viruses, we talked about enveloped viruses. The wolf in sheep's clothing, they have coated themselves in your tissue. And so they're gonna avoid the phagocyte because the phagocyte doesn't notice it. Now here's some of them, the phagocytes eat them and they don't die. Now that's a scary organism. And then they produce products that kill or damage phagocytes. Toxins, if something produces a toxin, it's said to be toxigenic. And this is what causes disease by certain organisms. And it's either to do with the gram negative cell wall or um, Proteins released from a living bacteria. Exotoxins are released from living bacteria during the exponential growth. And they go to other sites and can make you very sick and very dead. They're very hot toxins. And they often associate things like scarlet fever. Some diseases that really can kill you quickly. Uh, are caused by exotoxins. Killing the bacterium is a good thing because you get less toxins. Endotoxins are released when the bacteria are killed. So uh, they're usually less potent and less specific than exotoxins. But if you have uh, an organism that's releasing endotoxins and you kill them all, then you, they release more endotoxins. That's problematic. Here's a picture. Exotoxin, the cell's happy. Endotoxin, the cell is breaking down and the release from the cell membrane here. Examples of endotoxin releasing organisms, uh, the clostridial organisms such as uh, Clostridium botulinum, the Clostridium bacterium, it's not what kills you, it's the toxin that releases. Clostridium tetani, same thing. Exotoxins, some of the hemolytic strips, a lot of strips release exotoxins. 
okay, the portal of exit, how does it get out of the person and go infect somebody else? And they usually leave the same way they came in. So your nose got infected by breathing in, you infect somebody else by breathing out. Etiology of disease. Etiology means what caused it. And you have to have certain, you know, we don't always know the cause, but we look at patterns of infection and we name them accordingly. Okay, we may have local infections. The organism enters the body and it stays in a specific area. A little cut and you just have a little knot there that's infected. Focal, they're starting to spread. And that's getting kind of scary because once they spread from local tissues, then they can become systemic, which they get into the circulation system and go everywhere. Septicemia, you have multiplication of bacteria in the bloodstream. Bacteremia, you have bacteria in the bloodstream. Uh, this are usually going to be the same thing, but maybe not. Bacteremia may come and then you get septicemia. Toxemia, you got toxins in the bloodstream. Uh, botulism toxin, if somebody can keep you alive till it wears off uh, by keeping you on a ventilator, you'll live and no real harm will be done. Tetanus toxin, they're going to have to put you in an induced coma because of the seizures. But if they do and keep you on a vent, you can live. Viremia, you have viruses in the bloodstream. Patterns of infection, often you have mixed infections. You have one organism and then another one establishes itself too. Acute infection appears rapidly, severe symptoms, and then you're well or dead. Chronic infection, usually less severe, but it can hang on and on and on for a long period of time. Primary infection, you first, it's the thing you first get. Let's just take an example. You, you get the flu. Then you get a secondary infection. You get a bacterial pneumonia after that. That's a secondary infection. Follows the primary infection. Subclinical infection does not cause any apparent symptoms, but you can carry it over long periods of time. And this could be uh, a lot of things. Uh, COVID is a big example, but there was a uh, professor I had that I believe, and everyone believed, that he had subclinical salmonella. Everyone he came in contact with got salmonella. I was hospitalized over the salmonella. Horses he worked on got salmonella. But something, he, oh, he's the one who exposed 400 students to rabies accidentally. And he got moved along to another school. And then everybody quit getting salmonella. That's what was interesting to me. Okay, Koch's postulates. This has been discussed before. But to prove that an organism caused a disease, first, every time you have the disease, you have to be able to get that organism out of the disease, isolate it, and find it. If you inject it into a healthy host, it's going to have the same organism. You croaks, you do a test, and the organisms are still there. Now, exceptions to Koch's postulates. Some things you can't grow in a laboratory. You can't grow um, leprosy in a culture plate. It will grow in armadillo feet, foot pads. Many infections, many diseases can be caused by several different pathogens, maybe several different strains of strep, or staph, and other organisms can cause infection. And then a particular disease may be different depending on the portal of entry. And some diseases are caused by a combination of pathogens. And we can't just experiment with Koch's postulates on humans unless you really don't like that human because uh, it's really illegal to kill people and not very nice. And this is what this is going to say. I jumped the gun. Some pathogens are exclusively human pathogens and we cannot experiment on humans with things that are going to kill them. 
Epidemiology and public health. Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and cause of disease in populations. And it is the foundation of the logic of what we need to do to prevent disease. It's huge. How many people become infected, affected, infected, what the outcome is, and we have descriptive epidemiology. You just tabulate data on who got it, where they got it, age, gender, health history, sexual behavior, eating habits, socioeconomic status, all these things. Now, socioeconomic status is supposed to be that if you're poor that you don't eat as healthy, but um, I have a reasonably good job and I, I don't eat very healthy either, so I'm not sure you can always do that. Analytic epidemiology, you're looking at the cause and effect. Retrospective, you're looking at stuff after an epidemic. Prospective, you're looking at it during the epidemic. Experimental epidemiology, you have a hypothesis and then you do controlled experiments to study. Okay, very epidemiology is extremely important for public health. Now, the CDC is considered to be the central source, the final word on epidemiological information. Are they always right? I doubt it. But they're more right than anybody else. So it's probably a good idea to try to follow their guidelines if you can keep up with them. Wear the mask. Don't wear the mask. I just wear it. Okay. And I also got vaccinated for COVID. Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I know this sounds like something crazy to subscribe to, but if you go to cdc.gov, you can find the data on any kind of notifiable diseases. They have charts on how many people got syphilis where, in what state, in what city. They talk about Mostly they talk about COVID lately, but they talk about other things too. And I've been subscribing to this for more years than most of you have been alive. Uh, thankfully, it just comes online. I have to admit, I don't always read it because it's the same thing, but some, it's, it does have a lot of interesting information. Diseases in the population, we can talk about the prevalence, which is the total number of cases in the entire po population, or by incidence. This is new cases over time compared to the general healthy population. So new cases per susceptible cases would be incidence. And this is per 100,000 people. Changes in the prevalence and incidence of specific diseases are monitored. Uh, they've been doing this with flu for years, and of course now they're doing it with COVID-19 and other diseases as well. These disease categories are very important that you know. Endemic disease is there in a population. Uh, we have a bunch of common cold viruses that we've all had. We get them, we're immune to them, and we don't have a problem. Uh, I know an example of a person from the United States went and spent two weeks with a guy in Scotland. Now, they both got sick, and the, my guess is that they swapped viruses because they got sick at the same time. They each had just a little cold, but the colds here are slightly different than the ones in Scotland. So those are endemic diseases. We get exposed to them, we're used to them, except for now that we're all hermits, living alone on an island. But anyway, when we live together, we have endemic diseases. Sporadic diseases are ones that just break out occasionally. Botulism, bubonic plague, these are just sporadic. Epidemic is when you have an occurrence that's a greater frequency than usual in a given area such as if Griffin, Georgia had 100 cases of tuberculosis, that would be considered an epidemic. And there would be a whole lot of testing going on and a whole lot of schools closed until everybody got tested. 
pandemic worldwide epidemic big bad people are getting it here people are getting it in places where they're so poor there's no medical care and are dying in both places so pandemic is worldwide disease and this is you're living in a hundred year pandemic a hundred years ago uh, there was the uh, Spanish flu pandemic that killed people all over the world now we have the coronavirus pandemic COVID-19 that's killed people all over the world reservoirs for infection for an infection to continue to exist it's got to have a place to hang out and where they are stay are called reservoirs animal reservoirs are not uncommon if you have a disease that comes from animals to, and is transmitted to human that's called a zoonosis or zoonotic disease not zoonosis it's zoa it's just the way it's said the different types of zoonosis direct contact with the infected animal the dog has a ringworm this was a case I actually saw they'd had the dog to a different veterinarian and they'd been treating it with steroids thinking it had allergy and it had these beautiful little patterns all over it of baldness I said that really looks like a fungus and I gave him some medication for it I said don't let the kids play with this dog well sure enough they did one of the kids got the same thing and I said oh, hers the insurance pays for so we're using it on the dog <laughs> anyway they so that's a zoonotic disease contact with animal waste I don't know any other way to say it but don't eat turds how would anyone eat turds well when you don't wash your hands and you've been handling animal waste like you clean the cat box and you get some on your hands and you go cook food that's handling animal waste and eating turds we use a scoop thing and we never touch them and then we wash our hands anyway contaminated food or water there's places there's no clean water there's just none in India there's some major river and the government of India decided to declare that that river was some kind of goddess and hoping that people would treat it with better respect because they were pouring raw sewage in it and by the time you got down to the lower part of the river it's really bad well now that it's considered a deity everybody wants to go get in the river to get its blessings and the blessings they're getting them downstream are not good if contaminated food somebody coughs in your food somebody handles the food the reason they have those sneeze guards at the sneeze guards at the food bars is to keep people from sneezing their germs in your food contaminated hide furs or feathers uh, consuming infected animal products I had a, a classmate when I was in college who had to be the tough guy of the universe and he and his buddies went bear hunting it was a legal hunt and they cooked some bear steaks well he made his rare because he was going to prove how strong and great he was well he got toxoplasmosis and these organisms got into his heart and he never came back to school <clears throat> I don't know if he lived or not no one ever said but very bad uh, if you have wild animal game meat you probably really need to cook it same with pork and poultry beef just hamburger you got to cook well in case it has some kind of fecal contamination but steak you cook the outside of it the inside of it you know it doesn't have to be all that done but insect vectors insect bites the sick bird that has West Nile virus the insect bites you the mosquito it has to live in the insect for a while then it bites you then you get West Nile virus human carriers some humans are carriers for infectious disease they may be asymptomatic carriers like I mentioned my salmonella teacher he um, 
seem to be carrying it. You can carry other diseases. Typhoid Mary is a classic case. This was a cook in New York. Everywhere she worked, people would get typhoid fever and they would die. You know, lots of people were dying. And so she would move to a different place. And it was obvious that it's the food that she cooked that was getting people the typhoid fever. And finally, you know, she was banned from cooking anywhere. She just changed her name and get another job. Finally, she was banned to some island, basically in prison because she was killing people. She didn't know a way to make a living but cook. I guess they brought her food on the island, but and people quit dying. But when she did die, they did an autopsy on her, and her uh, gallbladder was just full of typhoid fever bacteria. She could have just worn a mask. It would have helped a lot. Okay, non-living reservoirs. A lot of organisms live in the soil, water, and food, and many pathogens the soil really love any of the fungi helmets bacteria they do really well in the soil contact transmission and you're having direct contact with a person uh, touching kissing sex respiratory tract infections staph measles scarlet fever stds these are all examples of contact transmission. Indirect, a fomite, or non-living object. Tissues, handkerchiefs. I don't think you'd bother, you'd borrow someone's tissue. Towels, if you hang up a community towel and, you know, for the whole family and the kids wipe their dirty hands on it and then you use it for your clean hands. That can be a problem. Bedding, bed bugs are apparently a problem in some hotels. That's just horrifying. Toys, this is a big problem in church nurseries and probably some daycares, but not licensed ones, I wouldn't think, because they're, they're inspected. You've got to sanitize toys because kids put them in their mouth. Clothing, don't share clothing. Diapers, eating utensils, drinking cups, don't drink after people. And then medical equipment and devices can be fomites. Droplet transmission, respiratory droplets. Someone coughs or sneezes on you. And then airborne transmission. This is tiny little droplets of mucus and it's not considered airborne unless it can go more than a meter. And uh, things that can spread aerosols Cleaning, sweeping, mopping, changing bed linens, changing clothes, dusting can spread aerosols all around that might be on the floor. Waterborne. We've already talked about the sewage. Uh, people have to drink bad water. Giardia, amoebic dysentery, cholera. Cholera it tends to follow natural disasters. Because when you have a hurricane that knocks out the water treatment plant, then people may drink bad water. If there's a chance the water's bad, you can boil it for 30 minutes to let it cool, and it should kill the cholera. Shigellosis, leptospirosis. Leptospirosis comes from rat urine or animals that have drunk out of creeks that had rat urine in it, and then they urinated it in. Uh, pathogens that are shed in fecal material, any kind of GI disease, can be waterborne. Foodborne, incompletely cooked foods that have organisms in them. Poorly processed foods, foods processed under unsanitary conditions. The peanut butter factory in South Georgia, they were not properly sanitizing their food prep surfaces every night. And there was peanut particles, there were peanut particles all over those conveyor belts and peanut grinders and rats and roaches crawled on them all night and then they're just up and ready to go the next morning. And a lot of people got sick from salmonella and some of those guys are in prison now because they knew it had salmonella in that peanut butter. 
but it was so much money's worth of peanut butter that they didn't uh, they, they didn't take it off the shelves and they were trying to just be greedy and they wouldn't have had it contaminated anyway if they weren't greedy because they could have paid people to sanitize things and then stuff that's not refrigerated or poorly refrigerated if you don't have your refrigerator turned down pretty cold it's not going to keep things really cool I think it needs to be 40 degrees Fahrenheit or less for the refrigerator contamination by normal flora uh, uh, just like we said a little cut and skin uh, you get skin infection zoonotic pathogens parasitic worms can be foodborne bodily fluids this is really important in healthcare workers just use universal precautions that means everybody is sick until proven otherwise everyone has AIDS until proven otherwise because otherwise you'll not take the care to protect yourself and right now healthcare workers are wearing masks and gloves when they're handling or when they're around people blood if you get a needle stick with somebody's blood you have potentially injected yourself with HIV uh, hepatitis B or C and what you need to do in that case is you need to let that bleed as much as it will and if the needle's been in them and then you let your your injury bleed as much as it possibly will scrub 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 let it bleed some more then you can put a band-aid on it then you go to HR or to security or wherever you do this at your job and fill out an incident report if you don't do an incident report within 24 hours it didn't happen and that at work and therefore the treatment is on you other bodily fluids that can carry diseases urine saliva any bodily fluids I don't think they'll listen okay vector transmission a vector is a animal that gives you a disease bugs arthropods are the most likely to transmit the pathogen and it may be part of their life cycle mosquitoes malaria ticks which are not insects even though if you look at the sentence you would almost think that they mean that but they're not and mites are not insects but ticks uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever Lyme disease or lichiosis these are all in the tick as part of their life cycle and the tick bites you it needs to stay on you for a good 24 hours to do a good job of transmitting the disease so if you're out in the woods and you get a tick some way though you should protect yourself from ticks but if you do get a tick be sure you check you know get it off within 24 hours lice lice can be body lice which is from just not taking baths and you will get diseases from them for sure and then head lice and then pubic lice fleas can spread diseases uh, blood sucking flies any kind of bugs or mites can be part of an insect vector mechanical vectors they don't have the disease themselves but they walk over germs and then walk on your food I thought of two examples and put in this roaches and ants nosocomial infection is acquired hospital acquired infection and this is the says among the 10 leading causes of death in the United States it's really huge so they go to the hospital and they catch something there and die or they may not die but one reason is because hospitals have sick people in them if they didn't have sick people in hospitals it'd be a lot easier on everybody uh, people who go to the hospital are weak and stressed they may have a compromised immune system be more susceptible to organisms but this is huge it's part of your responsibility is to be careful not to spread diseases from one place to another if you have a COVID ward a COVID hall you can't just go running up from there down to the surgery suite and back 
you need to totally change out your clothes and go home and take three weeks off and then go. Maybe not that extreme, but follow your company's protocols. Exogenous hospital acquired infections are caused by pathogens in the healthcare environment. This is their shed by sick people. Endogenous are by microbes that come from the patient. And it may be due to the immune system's declined, maybe from antibiotic drugs, which then they're on the drugs for a long time and it kills off all the normal flora. And then you have overgrowth and super infections of other bacterium that were originally normal. And this is what happens with Clostridium difficile or C. diff. Iatrogenic infections, this means you gave them the infection. Uh, not intentionally, obviously, but catheters, invasive diagnostic procedures, and surgery. Several years back, there was a hip implant for hip replacements that had something wrong with it that actually had, it grew bacteria. And so there was a recall on these implanted hips. And can you imagine, you've gone through that surgery once and you've got to do it again. But one guy that went through this surgery twice, he said, well, I got my house paid off, got it re-roofed, my car is paid off, and I've still got a lot of money in the bank. So they did have a very decent settlement, but I, I don't think I'd want the settlement. I think I'd just not want the pain. Transmission of hospital-acquired infections can be direct transmission from staff to patients, or visitors and patients, or patients to patients, or fomites. Things don't get very clean. Maybe the dishwasher's not getting things hot enough, or you're not washing your hands, or changing gloves, or anything. You're taking one thing from one person to another without sanitizing it. And then through the air conditioning system, this is especially important now that we have entire hospital wards filled with COVID patients. If the air conditioner does not have a filtration system in it that stops that virus and it goes to other halls and everybody's going to get it. Antimicrobial resistance in healthcare settings, drug resistant pathogens are going to increasingly become a threat and of the bacteria that are resistant, they're usually resistant to at least one thing you commonly treat them with. Uh, so it's quite a problem, and we've talked about it in another chapter. The more we use antibacterials and antibiotics, the more resistance we have. And there was a graph in the other, one of the other chapters that showed, well, it was a picture that showed, uh, we'll draw a little petri dish and then we'll draw what it happens to it. Okay, let's say the red dot is the mutant and it's resistant to antibiotics. And the blues are the pathogens that the bacteria, that the antibiotic kills. Well, all these are gonna divide by binary fission. So you give your antibiotic and you think you're gonna kill everything. Well, what actually happens, hopefully this is the same red, but is that you've now got a patient that's just as sick and they've got all these little red dots here. Those are the resistant bacteria. You give them the antibiotic again and you still got all those resistant bacteria. It doesn't do anything. Control and prevention. Each facility is going to have their own safety programs, policies, and procedures, and you need to be very sure you know what they are and you follow them. They're to prevent transmission of pathogens, and you legally have to go through bloodborne pathogen training every year. Proper hand washing and housekeeping. People, a lot of people don't realize how important the housekeeping staff in a hospital or healthcare facility or the college is, but they do a tremendous amount to prevent the spread of infection if they're properly trained. And then there are going to be infection control committees in any accredited hospital that goes through and has a plan on 
how to stop infection from transferring from one patient to another. Okay, that's all for this.